Okay, let's get started. Can you hear me okay in the back? Sounds good. <clears throat> All right. We have a lot to cover today. I need to um, kind of get us through concepts quickly so we can talk about very specific computational code, etc., so that we can take these ideas around deep learning and start to accelerate them using GPUs. And GPUs actually have a very important part to play in the kind of the explosion of deep learning uh, into, into technology. Now, I'll get to that. Now, before we do that, let's cover a few um, procedural things. Uh, so today's lecture, just looking at our syllabus here, is lecture 12. So, yeah, we're at lecture 12. We're going to talk about the project as well today at some point uh, before we're all done. What I want to point out is uh, next Tuesday, the lecture is already online. It's all about using Insight, which is an NVIDIA tool to do profiling of your GPU code. So you can find out what's working, what's not working. You can look at timelines to see uh, some very important information about your code running on the device. And those lectures are already uh, they were from a previous student who was part of one of our labs here, Carl Pearson. Um, has recorded them. So the point is, don't come to lecture. Instead, you can view those lectures online on your own time, and they're going to be really important for you for the project. Okay, so if you show up on Tuesday, um, I won't be here. Probably other people who accidentally show up will be here, or people that aren't here. Uh, but I'll make an announcement as well on Campus Wire. So that's October 4th, Tuesday. October 6th, a week from today, uh, I will be here, and as well, Professor Wenmei Hu, uh, who is uh, my former colleague, kind of originator of this course many years ago, is now a part of NVIDIA. And he's going to be telling us about kind of the historical perspective of GPU computing and also the future, like where are things going? I think it'll be really great to have him here and he will do that lecture, I hope in person. He hasn't said whether it'll be in person or whether we'll have him stream in on Zoom. But nonetheless, I will be here and hopefully you'll be here too and hopefully he will be here. So it'll be all in person and that's a week from today. So it makes sense? Uh, any questions about that? So don't show up next Tuesday, but do show up next Thursday. And I will post this on Campus Wire. Okay, with that in mind, uh, just a set of reminders. I already said this, I won't go through it uh, in detail. Labs will be fully graded by end of this week. Uh, midterm one uh, is in two weeks. Uh, if you have a conflict, you've got to let us know by tomorrow. And then project milestone one is due in two weeks, two weeks from tomorrow. Okay? And that project milestone, essentially, we're going to cover the code in this class, in this lecture. So again... It's rather straightforward, but it's going to be more complex than the, um, the labs we've been doing up to date. Okay. Got a lot to cover, so I want to just jump into it. But before we do, any questions? Uh, yes? Is it realistically feasible to get through the final project with a machine that can't run inside? No, because you will need to submit insight reports as part of what you do for your lab, for your project. But the, the GPU that we have connected to Rye 
You'll only be using Rye for all of this. We'll have insight, so you can use insight from there. Okay? All right, good. Well, let's just get on with it. Uh, um, okay, so we've been talking about uh, conventional machine learning. And I keep referring to this point in time where all of a the sudden, these concepts that we knew about, you know, networks that were multiple layers, maybe multiple layer perceptrons, or maybe something more complex involving convolutions, convolutional neural networks. We knew them in concept, but it was really hard to use them in practice because they required lots of data and they required lots of computation in order to train them. And then also lots of computation in order to take an input and get an answer on the output. Okay. We, so we kind of knew in theory, yeah, how, what, what these networks ought to look like, these deep networks. But it wasn't really until 2012 that a group of people, students, and researchers at the University of Toronto uh, entered a long-standing competition called ImageNet. Still around, and it was around well before 2012. It was a large-scale image, image recognition challenge that was part of ImageNet, uh, an annual conference where a bunch of images, dogs, cats, birds, boats, you can kind of see them arrayed here, with labels, well, this is a cat, and this is a dog, and this is a whatever that is, and so on and so forth. So it's a really a, a very well-defined task where you get those images, they run through your algorithm, and your algorithm has to classify. And up until 2012, primarily the techniques people were using were conventional computer vision techniques. And in 2012, this group of students and uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who was you know, the godfather of deep learning, um, one of the godfathers, um, they entered, but they were using a deep learning technique, convolutional neural network that had many layers that they were able to train using, you guessed it, GPUs. They had lots of practice data because at that point the internet was full of images. I mean, if you had said 2002, 10 years prior, there were no images on the internet at any scale. Right? So it was kind of this point in time where the data and the compute all of a sudden became the right inflection point such that after that point, looking at this graph, which I don't think I need to explain, there was no turning back. It was really kind of a magical moment. And what I said last time is, yeah, you know, the conventional techniques, whether they're computer vision or classical machine learning, kind of get to a point where you get 80% accuracy. That's good, but not good enough. With deep learning, now we're well beyond 90% accuracy. And that's not only good enough, it's like, wow, we can do something with that. We can start to drive cars autonomously with that and work robots and do all kinds of things with that. That's pretty, I mean, from a technological perspective, significant. So, what is it? Now, we're going to dive deep. It has to become very clear to the basic principles. So let's talk about that. Okay, and we're going to use a convolutional neural network as an example of this. And we ended the last lecture by taking this idea of a multi-level perceptron, which we understood from a computational perspective for forward pass, and also for the training pass, the back propagation. We understood that from a 
mathematical perspective, right? The problem with a multilayer perceptron is twofold. One, we lose all the spatial information related to images, right? What we did was we took those 28 by 28, or actually, yeah, whatever they were, 28 by 28 inputs, and we vectorized them, and we added them into the input of the multilayer perceptron. And I said that, well, what we're losing is kind of the spatial correspondence of those pixels, which is not an easy thing to give up. We have to rediscover it in the deep network, which adds additional burden for us. So, A, we don't want to do that. The second thing is that if we scale up to larger images, you know, and I we kind of walk through a computation uh, for a 250 by 250 image, we're talking about 4 billion learned parameters. That's just crazy for just doing digit recognition. We'd never be able to do digit recognition. So Jan Lacun, <clears throat> Lacun again, another instrumental figure in this whole deep learning um, breakthrough. He, he's still around. He's still very active now at Facebook. Um, he came up with this, the Linet. And this is the Linet 5, so presumably there were multiple Linets that led to Linet 5. And it was a convolutional neural network see kind of in this, in this structure here, in the upper layers, whereas the ending layers kind of ended with a multi-layer perceptron. So we're taking this idea of big inputs, 32 by 32 inputs, and applying convolutions initially, big ones. In fact, uh, we have Actually, uh, five by five convolutions to begin with. I, I, uh, let me make sure. No, seven by seven. I'll get to why in a moment. Um, and then we do a bunch of steps and we do more convolutions and some more steps. And eventually, these things here are a fully connected multi layer perceptron. And then at the end, softmax and all the other things to, to do in this case, hand written digit recognition, uh, digit recognition, okay? Makes sense? Now, why this works, uh, we won't dwell on it, but it works very well. Let's suffice it to say. So what I want to do is now talk about these convolutional layers. We understand convolution, right? We've done a lab on convolution. So let's see how it all fits in within this particular deep learning architecture called Linet 5. Before I go on, any questions? By the way, there's going to be a lot of detail coming. Okay, so and I know as a student, right, if you, get, if you don't understand a top-level concept, the details are just going to be meaningless. So if you have a question, now's a good time to ask. Okay. So let's talk about it from an input to output perspective. We've got some inputs. Maybe the inputs are the original image. Okay. And the original image, in this case, uh, 32 by 32. Or maybe it's an intermediate input. Meaning, you know, we're going to take these convolutional layers and we're going to stack them up, ultimately going towards a multilayer perceptron at the end. Okay, so kind of we think about these layers as composable. The input layer, right, takes the input image, but an intermediate layer will take the output of the previous layer as its input. Now, what is that input physically? We don't know. It's some weird image uh, 
or a weird something that's been generated by the previous layer. So, okay, we take that input, and generically speaking, it's an N1 by N2 input. It doesn't have to be square. Um, and then what we do is we apply to that <clears throat> input some set of masks. So we take mask zero, mask one, mask two, mask dot, 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 and minus one. So that convolutional layer, in terms of the number of outputs it generates, there will be one mask. So if we're generating three outputs, three masks. So we take that mask and we convolve the input with that mask to generate the output. That language that I just used, well, we just did a lab on it. We did a three-dimensional lab on it. Right? Well, this is a 2D case in the case of Linet 5. So we know how to do that. And we're just doing it multiple times, depending on the architecture of the deep network that we're working with. Okay. So the output, there's going to be <clears throat> B of them, because I've got one input, B outputs, or A inputs and B outputs. Okay. Where each output... I'm sorry, it's A times B outputs, because if I have A inputs, I, I'm going to generate um, wait. Yeah, I'm just uh, I, I, I just want to want to confuse the terminology here, which now I've confused myself. Anyway, there's some outputs. One per mask, where the size of each output is, is going to be important, and I'll come back to it. Okay, It's not like the mathematical convolution that we applied in lab two. Well, I'm sorry, lab four. What we're going to say is the output, each output, is smaller than the input. So what I'm doing is I'm not introducing new elements around the halo. I'm just saying that the halo only applies to real inputs. So the size of my output is n, which is the original a, minus k minus 1, k plus 1, k1 plus 1, which is really the mask dimension. Um, kind of reducing it by the mask dimension. And likewise, uh, in, in the other dimension, same thing. So really, these outputs are smaller than the inputs. Make sense? That's the idea. That's what the convolutional layer is. And we'll see some examples of this in a moment. Now, <clears throat> because... Excuse my voice for a sec... <clears throat> because we often, when we work, work with convolutional neural networks, we're working with images. And oftentimes, they're not grayscale images, they're color images. When we work with images, uh, the idea of a channel gets introduced. Okay, uh, An image, you can think of as having um, three channels, if the image is an RGB image. Red channel, is how much red does each pixel comprise of, how much green, and how much blue. And we will treat these channels separately because actually in the image representation itself, we represent them separately. So <clears throat> really the input is a multi-channel input. So if I have an A, it's really R, G, B. Three channels. Okay. So my convolutional layer might have three separate masks for each output. 
a red mask, a blue mask, and a green mask, given those three channels. So I take those three channels, I convolve them over the input to generate one output, where I'm going to sum across the masks. Okay. This is just by convention. And it's just something we need to keep, mi keep mindful. We need to be mindful of because when we write our code, we're going to assume we've got multi-channel input that gets summed for any output. Okay. That's, again, what we're doing is we're talking about how this particular layer is working, right? So this little triangle here is essentially what I just talked about in those two slides, a convolutional layer. So in this case, I've got a 32 by 32 input, and my output, C1 output, is six 28 by 28 output features. We call them features. That's a word we throw around often in, in deep learning. This is an input feature. This is an output feature. This is an input feature. This is an output feature. Uh, actually, actually, I said it wrong. Input feature into this layer. Output feature from this layer. Input feature into this layer. Output feature from this layer. Input feature, so on and so forth. So when we come to this layer right here, this convolutional layer here, let's try to describe it, what's, what's happening here. So we've got six outputs. Let's say it's an RGB image, three-channel input. How many masks do I have? Let's see who's paying attention and who can string this all together. How many masks in total do I have? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Nope. In total, how many masks? Yes. How'd you get to 18? Perfect. 18. How big are they? Yes. How'd you get to five by five? Uh, the input size is thirty-two, and the output size is twenty-eight. Uh, the thirty-two minus k plus one are two. Thank you. Uh, let me see if you did the math right. So, um, we are reducing each dimension by four. Right. So, we kind of pick two pixels off here, two pixels off here, two pixels off here, two pixels off here, in order to generate the output, which is 28 by 28. So the mask that accomplishes that is a 5 by 5 mask. So we have 18 5 by 5 masks that generate this output feature. <coughs> These six output features. Question. Sorry, you said 18. Does the input have three channels? Yes. So it should be 3 by 32 by 32. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm saying in this case, probably in, in the case of Lynette 5, it probably was a single grayscale, but I'm saying if we had three channels, what would it look like? Okay, question. So then our first layer essentially converts the color image to a grayscale image, and then all the other layers take one grayscale image and convert it to another? I wouldn't call it a grayscale image. I would call it a combined image. Right? We don't know that it's gray per se, right? It's some weird thing. These are not, you know, they, they look like images. They're pixels, but, you know, they've been combined somehow by, in, within the network. Yes? Um, this is probably more theoretical, but what, what, what's the rationale of having three different masks for the three different channels instead of having a mask that gets applied to, or a uniform mask that gets applied to all the channels? Uh, because... Sometimes there's information content in the red channel that's different than the information content in the blue channel. Like, let's say you're trying to recognize flowers. Okay, there's probably a lot of information in the red channel for flowers because that's flowers, right? That's the biological nature of them. 
So we separate them out because we're recognizing different things. Okay. Not every, not every image network needs RGB. It kind of depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Uh, good question. I think you should be able to answer that. Uh, if we're just doing the math that we talked about, no, because it's all order. It's all associative. It's a round addition, right? So it's a show associative. So we can reorder it if we want to. Uh, but yeah, maybe there's some networks where the order doesn't matter. In fact, there used to be a class of networks that were very popular called recurrent neural networks. And their order would matter, but that's architecturally specified in the network. Okay, uh, moving on, let's see. So, okay, now, what you'll notice, I'm just gonna flip back here, is that we kind of go from the convolutional layer here, which we just fully described. Right? We know if you had to sit down, spend five minutes just writing down the algorithm from, for going from here to there, you can do it. You should be able to do it based on everything we just talked about. Okay, now let's talk about this, which has a different name, subsampling. Okay, it's really taking the output of that convolutional layer and doing something with it. All right, and it's an important step in these deep learning, deep learning architectures. And it's very simple, super simple. It's got a lot of fancy mathematical terms we often associate it with it, but it's very conceptually simple. What we're doing is we're gonna take a big input and we're gonna try to reduce it. I'll say it again, because that's all we're doing. Big input, and we're trying to reduce it to condense the information. Okay, so for example, I might have a uh, four by four input, let's just say. So four pixels by four pixels, 16 pixels, that I'm saying, no, you know what I wanna do is I'm gonna represent it by a two by two. Because I'm just trying to reduce the amount of information. I don't want to throw the information away. That would be silly. But I want to reduce and condense it. How do we reduce and condense information? Well, we can take the max. We can take the average. We could take various forms of the norm. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. We can do a weighted average. Lots of ways we can do this. We all understand average, right? So let's say we have a four by four. So I've got a four by four thing as input. I'll just draw it out here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, well, this is gonna be one output pixel. And I've got a, this thing here, which will be another output pixel. And I've got this thing here, which will be yet another output pixel. And then finally, this thing here, which will be the th fourth output pixel. So how do I calculate these four output pixels? Well, I could take the max of this input. I could take the average, the L1, L2 norm, the weighted average. You invent it, we can create it. So that's all I'm doing. That's called pooling or subsampling. And why, why do we do this? <clears throat> because what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to collapse lots of different variations into more condensed form. 
very effective and necessary in these deep networks. <clears throat> you know, in the, in the classical image uh, computer vision world, oftentimes if we're trying to do things like face recognition and we have a very high resolution input image, you might think, well, the higher the resolution, the better the recognition. And the fact is, it's too many details. I mean, think about it from a human perspective, right? In order to recognize somebody's face, you don't need them to be right in front of you. You can actually recognize them from quite far away. So the essential amount of information to do the recognition is not at the highest resolution possible, right? So that's the fundamentally the idea here, is we want to downscale, but not too much. Okay, so that's the pooling layer. Okay, let's talk about these, again, <clears throat> from a mathematical perspective. Uh, just kind of, on one slide, let's just throw it on the, throw it here. Right. For forward propagation, what I have is some input, B images, C channels per image, H by W pixels per channel. Right. That's the input, right? No one is confused by that here, I hope. That's the simple part. Those are the input features into this particular layer. So now we take that and we've got weights. We've got M feature maps, okay, um, with C channels per map and K by K pixels per channel. So that's a K by K map, M of them, dealing with the, the C channels that are on the input image. Right? Again, that's just restating what I said before we do the convolutional layer at that point, right? That's lab four in two dimensions. And then we generate the output <coughs> where we have B images. We didn't lose any images. So B images came in. We have B images out. Um, for each image, we've got M features meaning M outputs, because we have M masks. Okay, so each image comes in, we generate M outputs, where each output is H out by W out pixels, where H out and W out is just a reduction based on the mask, right? So, yeah, we know this. But on one slide, there it is. Now you can write code. And that's what we're going to do. Um, uh, if you want to see, if you're confused and you're like, I, I, I kind of get 80% of what he's saying. I don't fully get it. Just a quick example. Okay, I've got these inputs three channels, one input, and I've got three masks for that output, three masks for that output. Okay, and because my mask is a four by four, a two by two mask, my input is a three by three input, my output turns out to be a two by two output. So if you wanted to see concretely how all of it plugs together, it's all right here. Right, so I take that mask and I apply it to this input. I do the math and I get that and da, 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 da. Okay, so if you wanted to work through this, it's there in the slides. But I want to move forward here. But before I do, let's take a quick pause for questions. Again, if you're feeling like I'm 80% of the way there, it's useful to walk through this as an exercise. Yeah, question. Ah, oh, that's a really good question. 
<clears throat> I don't know that I would say that that's what we're doing because when we array these things together, okay, what you'll find is, well, the output is a subsampling layer feeding a convolutional layer, feeding a subsampling layer, layer, feeding a convolutional layer. Okay, so to some extent, what you're saying, maybe it makes sense to subsample first and then convolve, is actually what's done in a deep network. Makes sense. <clears throat> okay, good. I know this is detailed, right? And it needs to be because we've got to write some code. It's got to make sense. Well, here's that code. So this, look at this. Like We've got six, seven layers of for loop. And I'll tell you, within five minutes, this code will make complete sense to you. It's not that hard. But my point is, that's a lot of computing. It's happening down here where we've got the add and the multiply, the real work, right? That's the, the thing that takes any time other than the data transfer. So well, what, what is this crazy structure here? Well, let's start from the outside and work our way in, right? So outermost, outermost loop for each image. I've got... 10,000 images, 60,000 images, half a million images. Well, for each image, one image at a time. Now, for each image, I want to calculate one of M output features. So, good. Now, for each output feature, I've got M of them, so my loop is 0 to M. Now, for each output feature, I have some horizontal dimension and I've got some vertical dimension based on the mask. Actually, no, based on the image size, the input feature size. Okay. Then I am going to iterate over all the input channels. <coughs> and then I'm going to do a K by K filter where the innermost loop of that K-by-K K filter is the convolution. So it's not that hard, right? It should make complete sense. In fact, one of the beauties of, and the power of these convolutional networks is well, the computation is pretty dense and easy to describe. Dense, that's a word we're going to talk about quite a bit. And I say it's dense because I'm not skipping. I don't have to skip any of these loops. Like that. I'm just going to do the entire loop. Make sense? Any questions? Okay, great. I'm surprised there's no questions. I hope it doesn't mean that you're just willfully lost. Let's do a quick example. <clears throat> so if you are lost, <clears throat> hopefully it gives you a chance to catch up. So what we're going to look at here is some input and an output. So in this case, what we have is, <coughs> excuse me, um, x, b, so it's one of our images in the batch, or one of our images in the input. Sometimes we call it a batch. So which image? I don't know, it's B, image B. And we're gonna look at input channel one on that image. So I've got that second dimension, which is all the input channels. What do you think the other two dimensions are? X and Y, right? I've got X pixels, Y pixels, so. That fully describes an input image. Okay, so input image, channel one, let's take a mask. We'll take mask zero. How many masks do I have? I have M of them. 
Now I'm just going to pick zero for the moment. Input channel one, right? Because that's the input channel for the input image. Which means that for the output map, it's the B output or image B. And we're dealing with output map zero for the moment. And again, these two are just the X and Y for the output image. So, okay, fine. That's, that's where we are. So X B comma one comma underscore underscore, where underscore means we don't care, looks like that. It's an image, channel one of the image. And maybe that's what channel zero looks like and maybe that's what channel two looks like, but those are the three channels for this particular image. And it's a four by four image. I've got a three by three mask, which means I'm gonna generate a two by two output. So if I kind of look at it, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this mask and apply it to this little piece of the data, which means I'm gonna convolve these nine elements with this nine element mask. And I guess if we do that, we end up with zero. Um, that doesn't make sense. I guess as I walk through it, we, we end up doing the calculation here. Okay, so really what I'm doing is, um, I'm gonna first do it on channel zero, channel one and channel two in order to calculate what the output is for this particular element on the output mask, okay? Again, that example is here in the slides. Any questions on it? Does it make sense for us to walk through that? Would it help? It would help? Okay, let's do it. All right. We have time. I think I'm trying to rush through this and I don't want to do that. Okay. So, we're going to go through the full example. But before I do that, any questions? No questions? Okay, well, let's do it. So here's, here, what is our end goal? Our end goal is to calculate y, b, zero. Okay, that is one output feature corresponding to image b, mask zero. Okay, so we're, we're calculating one output feature. In fact, really what we're doing is we're calculating the upper element of that output feature. So what goes into the calculation of this single element? Okay, well, what goes into the calculation of that single element is we take, so this is mask zero, channel zero. This is mask zero, channel one, and mask zero, channel two. So I've got three channels, three masks, but they're all really corresponding to mask zero, which is what I need to calculate feature map zero for this beef image B, okay. So, okay, I've got those three masks. I've got these three input images that correspond to channel zero, channel one, channel two. So I'm gonna take mask zero and overlay it on top of 
these entries right here. Okay, so when I do that, really what I'm doing is I'm multiplying one by one, right? You know how a convolution works. One multiplied by one, plus two multiplied by two, one, plus zero multiplied by one, plus one multiplied by two, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth, and I think what you end up with is 18. You understand how I got that 18? I'm not done. Because what I need to do is now incorporate into that mask zero channel one. Okay? But everybody with me on how I computed the 18. Raise your hand, ask a question. We've got time. Anyone? Yes. This second mask here, it is mask zero, channel one. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. This example is for channel zero, and that's why we're only computing the 18 at this point. The next, next slide it will be for channel one. The next slide will be for channel two. We're staying with mask zero. Okay, all of these are for mask zero. Mask zero. Mask zero. Okay? So, let, let, it'll, it'll be clear, let's just keep going. Okay, I think it'll make sense. Remember, in order for me to compute, entirely compute, this output, okay, this output here, I need to, for each element, add together all the channels. So the next step will be to take mask zero channel one, which is this mask here, and compute the corresponding convolution here. So I add to the 18, seven plus three plus three, which leads us to 31. Then finally, the, net, the last step is to to add in the contribution from channel two. So here's the channel two mask. Here's the region of the input upon which to apply the channel two mask. And I add to the 31 that was there, three plus six plus 11, and then we're done. Okay, make sense? Question. Um, so I was just wondering what the purpose of having three different channels if we're combining them at the end anyway. Yes, yeah, so what is the purpose of having three different channels if we're combining them anyway? Um, yeah, again, it has to do with uh, collapsing the information. Um, sometimes we've got these red, green, blue channels, like for an image, and we want to treat them differently at first. But once we've extracted that information, combining them is the right thing to do. Okay, sometimes we don't combine them until much, much later in the network. It all depends on the network itself. Okay, I don't wanna talk about the network itself because there's hundreds of variations. I wanna talk about generically the computation. Okay, so let's say that we're combining the channels. Question. No, same mask, but we just apply the mask on a different region of the input, just like we would with a regular convolution. Okay. By the way, what are the masks? What do they represent? 
learned features. We don't know what their values are. We're going to learn these values. How are we going to learn them? Well, not completely backpropagation, which has auto differentiation as a part of it. Right? This idea that we talked about last time, where we know what the error is, and we can talk about the error as a differentiable function. If we can differentiate that function, we know how to kind of go downward in terms of trying to minimize that error. We can compute the gradient of that error. If we can compute the gradient of that error we can propagate that gradient backward through the network so that we can adjust these masks to try to minimize that error. Question. This is a question on that process, but since like the last lecture you said that uh, when you do that, you, you'll usually just get to a local minima. Is it common to do it, like to do that process multiple times with like slight random adjustments? So oh, yeah. Get to lower? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, these are all part of the process of training your network. Perturbing it, randomizing it. Uh, yeah, because getting into a local minima is often what happens. Okay, good. Let's keep moving forward. Um, so, now, okay, so a lot, uh, clearly a lot of compute happening. I'm just flipping back. I just want to bring up Lynette 5. So here we are, Lynette 5. Um, we've got this convolutional layer. We've got another, con we've got this subsampling layer. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Got another convolutional layer, probably more. In, in fact, in a modern network, could be 20 to 30 layers of convolution. So lots of convolutions happening. So we essentially want to take all those convolutional layers and run them as CUDA code. That's, in fact, what your project is. OK, so how are we going to do that? Well, we have to start talking about the parallelism here. And clearly, these convolutions are parallel. We know that because we already did that. Um, we've got output features. Each of them can be calculated in parallel. Um, each of the output features has pixels, which could be calculated in parallel. And dot, 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 dot. It's just lots and lots of parallelism, especially at the outermost layers. But as we walk inward in the network, because we're taking big inputs with big masks, and we're trying to squeeze out the information, the parallelism starts to shrink as we get to the lower layers. But thankfully, so does the amount of compute. So somehow we've got to balance all this out. Okay. And um, and that's really part of the art of what we're going to be talking about here. By the way, if anybody has done deep learning and you've used something like PyTorch or TensorFlow, you don't even have to worry about this, right? Because somebody has already figured out how to run this thing on a GPU for you. Nowadays, your code runs on the GPU, but you don't even know it. Um, but in this course, in this project, what we're doing is we're building the PyTorch primitive that runs on the GPU for you when you do a convolutional layer. OK, so how do we think about the parallelism? We'll get to that. But let me just throw in there the subsampling layer, right? just so that we all understand it. Subsampling layer is pretty easy, because I'm taking an image input, which is coming out of a convolutional layer. So let's say it's output Y, I've got B images, M features per image, because that's what the output layer looks like, H out by W out in terms of size. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an average over n by n blocks. So that is, I take an n by n set of pixels, and I reduce it to one pixel by calculating the average. That's my uh, subsampling methodology I'm using for this particular example. OK, so 
the output is going to be some subsampled version of h and w, which is really h out divided by n, w out divided by n, floor, just because of uh, that. And then usually what we'll do is we'll throw the nonlinearity in there too, the sigmoid, the ReLU. Remember that we talked about those. We still have those. But it's going to be the output of the subsampling layer. It's going to be blended in. Um, yeah, that's what we do. And if we wrote the code out, the code is, again, pretty simple. Uh, for each image, for each output feature map, for each output value, I essentially do the averaging code, which is right here, for all the pixels in that little region. And then once all that is done, I do the nonlinearity, which in this case, this example is a sigmoid. Okay, so there we go. We know what the convolutional layer looks like. We know what the subsampling layer looks like. That's it. That's really it. That's, that's a deep network. And you could be thinking, well, this just doesn't make any sense to me as to why this would work. Well, join the club. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the magic of what we've stumbled upon here. Okay. So now we have about 20 minutes. And at this point, we have an understanding, at least I've told you, and maybe you haven't absorbed it. We have an understanding of the CPU computation involved to do a convolutional layer and a subsampling layer. Quickly, any questions? Because now we're going to talk CUDA. Yes? What about the layer with the fully connected multi-layer perceptron? Do we implement that on the CPU or on the GPU? Those are really simple and easy to do on a GPU because it's just vector, matrix vector multiply. By the way, vector matrix, matrix vector multiply. See all this stuff that we just talked about here? We're going to convert it into matrix vector multiply because that's a computational pattern that feels friendly to us. Hang on. I'm hoping we can get there before the lecture is done. Yeah. Um, a few slides ago, uh, the one about parallelism in the convolution layer, it says there's the output feature map and the input feature map. Uh, can you differentiate those two really quickly? I'm not sure which one is which. Okay. Input feature map, input. Output feature map, output. That's all that means. That's it, yeah. Question. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I can't give you a good answer to that. Okay, but let, let, it, let us say it's a puzzle, <laughs> okay? There's no good answer to that. All I can do is maybe refer back to the masks I showed you in the previous lecture, right, where we were looking at uh, for a multi-layer perceptron. What does the mask look like for layer one? What does the mask look like for layer two? Right, do you recall those? Those were like ghostly images of numbers, really. Why? I don't know. Okay. I, I can hand wave my way through it, but I'm not sure it's going to get to what you're asking. Yes? Will we implement that application? Will we implement? No, we won't. Okay. You can if you want. We can give you extra credit if you want to do it. Nope. Again, it's not hard, but it can be done. Okay? All right. Good. Now let's talk about CUDA. So what we need to do is, okay, we know, we know what we need to do. We need to do, we've got lots of images, lots of masks, lots of convolution. 
So let's break it down into a single image for the moment with a bunch of masks. And we're trying to take those images, or take that image and the bunch of masks and generate some output. Okay, so and what we can say is, again, there's so many ways to do this. I'm just gonna give you one. So let's say each block is gonna compute a tile of output pixels for one output, one feature output. In fact, I, I hate the word feature. It's so overloaded. <laughs> okay. Um, tile width, again, is going to be used to describe the number of pixels, X and Y, in the output. So the output has some number of pixels. We're gonna tile it. Right? That's typically what we do. So each thread computes one pixel of output, in this case. You got a tile of them, and that's a block. Um, and what we're gonna say is, okay, so I've got, um, some number of masks and for each mask I'm computing some number of tiles of output. Okay, so in the grid's x dimension we're going to say maps to the number of features, outputs, output features. The grid's y dimension maps to the number of tiles in each of the outputs. And grid Z dimension could be the number of images in the batch, in the input. We're not gonna talk about it here though. Okay, so let me put this in more concrete terms. So, I, actually I like this one here. Let's, let's keep this one here. So what we're gonna say is we've got these rows, okay, and these rows correspond to masks. We've got four masks. Actually, no, I'm sorry. Um, let me just use this one. So I've got tiles in my x dimension, blocks in my x dimension, blocks in my y dimension. And in my x dimension, I've got four. I've got a dimension of four. Each of those corresponds to a single mask. So I could say, this is mask zero, this is mask one, this is mask two, mask three. Okay. And the tiles, I'm sorry, the blocks in each of those columns is gonna generate an output. So I've got four outputs, one for each mask, and the columns of blocks are generating the output. So the Y dimension, my block's Y dimension, corresponds to all the blocks that are participating in the generation of an output. Okay, let's keep going and hopefully this will become clear. So, Okay, so now within a block, okay, what we're gonna do is we are going to, Okay. 
Okay, so, sorry, I'm just collecting my thoughts here. Okay, so let's consider this an output feature right here. So we've got one output map that we're trying to calculate. And let's say this output map has W out, H out dimensions. So, and if my tile size is tile width, that is the number of threads within each block is tile width by tile width, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to tile that particular output map with um, <clears throat> W out divided by tile width, number of blocks in that dimension, and H out divided by tile width, blocks in that dimension. Okay, so yeah, we can write some CUDA code to do that. So my tile width is 16. The number of horizontal tiles I'm gonna have is W size divided by W out, I'm sorry, W out divided by tile width, and then my horizontal size, or the number of vertical tiles I have, is H out divided by tile width. Okay. That said, here is the code for us to calculate one tile width, one block of output for a feature map. Here's the kernel to do that. Again, using no shared memory optimization, right? This is a basic generic kernel that probably is going to get lousy performance because it will be memory bandwidth limited. But that's what that kernel would look like. And again, the idea here is that each CUDA thread is calculating one output pixel. Okay, using, again, the standard idea from uh, a 2D, 2D convolution. So we are factorizing the, the first. Yeah, what we're doing is we are, if I go back to my CPU code, okay, and I'm just looking at this CPU code here. Each CUDA thread is going to be doing that. Actually, the CUDA thread is going to be doing this right here. Uh, sorry. Let's say for the moment the CUDA thread is doing this. Uh, but you're right, we can include the channel there too. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking the outer three loops and we're mapping them into the block. Now we've got a block of threads. That block of threads is essentially gonna be doing that computation right there. Okay. I will let you guys struggle with this code, um, but, but you know, I think that it's, it's probably pretty straightforward once you uh, put in your mind the, the details of it. Okay, um, again, I'm gonna say this and hopefully it'll be meaningful for you. This is lab four in two dimensions. Really it is. Okay, you just gotta make sure that you fully understand that, hey, really, we've got a set of images, we've got channels, and we've got a set of masks. Right? It's just a slightly more complex version of that, but again in two dimensions. Yep. Uh, so when you, when you launch this uh, grid, it only computes output channel, right? So you need to launch the grid multiple times or do you need to change the dimension for it? No, see, I, we're going to include the channels here. I didn't mention it, but the channels are included here. Right. 
Yes. Yes. Is it long times or do you need to kind of include that when you're setting your dimensions? Yeah. Kind of the simplifying assumption we're making is that there's only one output channel. So we're only doing it once, but you're right. If there were multiple output channels, we would we would do that. Yes. Um, so just to be clear, uh, this is just for kernel, but um, when we or this is just one block. So the question is, what do we define as our entire grid dimension? Is that all? How do we map? Right. So that was what I was saying earlier. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say that the grid itself is defined by m output maps and the y dimension is the number of tiles in each output map okay that's how we define our grid okay now i'm going to throw a curveball at you as if there was already not enough in this lecture. And then I'm going to throw this curveball at you because for some of you, you're going to want to do this as one of the optional optimizations for your uh, milestone three on your project. We can take what we've been doing, right? So here's another view of what we've been doing. Input features, convolutions, output features, and running a straightforward convolution there. Okay, we can take what that looks like and represent it as this. This green horizontal vector corresponds to the green masks. One, one, two, two, one, one, two, two. One 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 da 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 da. Right, just so you see it. These masks, I'm just representing as a row vector. The blue masks, I'm going to represent as a separate row vector. Yeah. So that transformation is trivial. Now, wouldn't it be great if I could just represent that convolution as a simple dot product, as a simple dot product of something? But let's kind of walk through what it requires to do that, right? So I'm taking this mask here and I'm multiplying it by these elements. And a convolution is a dot product, really. So what if I said, okay, I'm, I'm convolving here. I'm also convolving here, but on this mask. And here, but on this mask. So I represent the masks as such. But let me represent my column vector here as this input, this input, and this input. Kind of unrolled and put into this format. This is just the input image represented differently. Likewise, if I'm calculating this task, I would just apply it directly on that same input vector. Right? Because that's exactly what I'm doing to calculate one of the elements of the output. Now, this here is just all those green elements circled in green represented differently. If I were to do the same thing for the other elements of the output map, I would have that. Right? And that, what, what, is, what do these correspond to? Well, they correspond to, and I'll, and I'll draw this in a separate color, These elements, these elements, and these elements. Two zero one three, two zero two zero one three, two one three two, two one three two, and so on and so forth. 
until I've unrolled all the input. Now my convolution turns into a, actually in this case, a matrix matrix multiply in order for me to generate the output. But it comes at some cost. What's the cost to do that? Yeah. Well, it's the unfurling and unrolling cost, but the unrolling cost has some kind of data replication, right? This two here, what is that two? Let me erase this stuff on the slide. This two in the input feature corresponds to This two here, it's the same thing. Right? Really, it's this two here, kind of appearing in two spots in the input. So if there's some amount of data replication I need, that's required for me to achieve the transformation of the convolution into a matrix matrix multiply. Okay. And it turns out to be able to do all this pretty straightforward if you keep track of things like indices. And I'm just flipping through these because these are just examples. Um, you, you can see how uh, that, that the convolutional filters and the input features can be multiplied together. And we can even analyze how much replication we're gonna have. And the replication starts to approach about two, two X, in terms of memory size for a variety of inputs. So it comes at a cost if I'm explicitly copying inputs in order to create this unrolled version of the input features. Okay, but there are ways to alleviate that cost. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just zipping through here, but um, the algorithm to do this is here in the slides. It's actually very straightforward. It's just a matter of keeping track of indices, um, uh, kind of keeping track of the unrolling starting point. Okay, very easy to do it, but it doesn't always lead to a performance benefit. And this is where I wanted to end with, okay? Because at this point, um, uh, we're gonna implement some of this stuff in our, in our project uh, where you can do a pretty simple 2D convolution you can start to implement the matrix multiplication. You can start to do with matrix multiplication with kind of implicit unrolling where you're only unrolling into shared memory and then do all this crazy stuff where you're trying to do res register allocation along with that shared memory tiling. Okay. For some of you, you're gonna do what's on the slide. Some of you may choose, well, I'm just gonna stick with a simple convolutional approach and see how far I can get with it. Okay, so the project is now online, or it will be online uh, at some point today. Let me just quickly end with this. The project has three milestones. Uh, CPU version, October 14th, uh, early November, a baseline GPU convolution kernel, and the end of the semester, December 2nd, you do the best optimizations you can, and all along the way, you'll be putting stuff on Canvas as your deliverables. Okay, again, it's gonna be all online. Thank you. <laughs>